Okay. Uh, yeah. Uh, thank you. Um, yeah, I'm Nevin Golnic, and today I'll be talking to you about the vernization of charge and current vertices in the GWBSC method, and actually more about the method and later on about the vernization. And this is a project as part of my PhD under uh, the supervision of professors Geroncoli and Despoja. Um, so the project was actually, um, just some of my slides are not, okay. Um, so the project, um, just to give the outline of the talk, I'll be introducing you to basically the, like the physical motivation to do, uh, to work with quasi two dimensional crystals and their optical properties. Then I'll talk about the motivation to develop our own code to calculate these properties, some theory and examples, as well as the final part, which is uh, related to the linearization. So basically in 2D materials, the electric field is weakly screened and is highly non-local, which gives rise to many different and interesting properties, which are basically collective excitation modes within um, this type of materials. And these are usually stacked layers of graphene and analogous materials such as TMDs or uh, hexagon burn nitride and similar. And what you have is that these modes, uh, apart from existing within uh, the material themselves, can hybridize between layers, but they can also hybridize with an external electromagnetic field and create new uh, hybrid modes, which are polaritonic modes. And depending on the material, you will have different types of these collective modes, uh, which will, of course, give very different types of dispersions. So once they hybridize with light, the, basically the light line bends and you get um, these very interesting formations. So the dispersion is basically like your fingerprint to, to observe these collective excitations. Um, so I'm mostly going to be interested in excitons, which are uh, strictly speaking like uh, tightly bound electron hole pairs. And basically you have to do two things to uh, describe excitons which hybridize with light which are going to form exciton polaritons, uh, polaritons, you have to calculate an optical spectrum, absorption spectrum at a very high level. And then you have to couple it with uh, your photonic field uh, to observe the polaritonic, exciton polaritonic hybrid modes. And usually the first part, people do it uh, by solving a two particle Hamiltonian at a high level. But the second part is usually done in a microscopic model uh, and not really accounting for the quantum electrodynamic photonic field. So this is the thing that we are trying to address and do a propagator approach to calculating these properties. So in the first part to calculate the optical spectrum, usually like for example, in packages like YAMBO, people calculate a static screening, they construct a BSC kernel, and then they diagonalize the two particle Hamiltonian and eventually obtain the final dielectric function. But there are certain limitations to this approach. And one of the thing is that basically you have to solve the whole Hamiltonian uh, and re-diagonalize it each time that you want to change some little thing with it. You, can, you don't really have the flexibility to uh, separate different contributions like RPA or lighter contributions and recalculate just parts of it. Then again, the, the, the Hamiltonian method is also uh, basically a, um, an eigenvalue problem and you get a discrete eigenspectrum. It's a zero temperature model where it requires some post-processing to, to come to the finest temperature. And what is the biggest uh, deal breaker is that you cannot directly uh, describe the polytonic modes because the photon, uh, photon retardation effects are neglected. Um, also, so in the propagator approach, on the other hand, you, the spectrum is going to be continuous by design and at fine temperature. And also we will include by using the photon propagators, we are going to have retardation effects included. Also with some approximations in the Hamiltonian model, you really have to add each atom in your system. So if you want stacked layers, you really have to include them in your crystal. While in the propagator approach with a bit of approximation, you can easily uh, do a very high level calculation on a monolayer and then combine in a final equation these individual response functions and obtain um, like for a very large heterostructure, your, your basic uh, response properties. 
Uh, also, if you want to include a substrate in a Hamiltonian model, it, you have the same, same issue that you have to really include the atoms of the substrate. While here, we can just modify the photon propagator to include uh, this type of scattering. So the methodology is basically can be divided in two steps. You do the very classical thing of to obtain the grand state wave functions, for example, from quantum espresso. And then you take these wave functions and compute the bare and screen chroma interaction. We apply GW by quasi particle corrections, uh, construct the BSC kernel and solve a quantum electrodynamic beta salpeter equation. So how do we go about it? This Hamiltonian basically has three um, three parts, which describes first the Kronsham electron subsystem. Then you have a part which describes the free photon subsystem. And you have uh, the last term, which describes your electron photon interaction, which is going to be important both to describe the electron photon interaction within the system, but also with an external electromagnetic field. Um, so, yes, this last term contains an uh, electron current operator, which will be related to the fermion field operator and contains your Kronsham states. And you also will have a photon field operator. However, we will not actually be working with this Hamiltonian. Instead, we recast the problem in terms of time ordered propagator for the electromagnetic field. And we perform like a perturbative expansion of this propagator over all connected diagrams. And you can extract basically a Dyson's equation for the electromagnetic field in a reciprocal space, which will contain two major components, uh, D0, which is your time ordered propagator for the free photon field, and then a self energy, photon self energy, which is going to describe the polarization within your uh, quasi two dimensional crystal. We also assume separable subsystems and that the operators are in the interaction picture. Um, okay, so if you draw out final diagrams for this contribution, so you have basically two steps that you have to do. First is calculating the photon self energy, which will contain your different contributions through the RPA contribution, then your self energy correction, which is basically just GW, and then vertex corrections, which are essential to describe the binding of the electron hole pair. Um, so this vertex, so this equation, and then basically when you obtain the photon self energy, you plug it in into Dyson's equation for the electromagnetic field, which will finally give you also the uh, hybrid, like the hybridization with the external photons. So okay, so it's basically like calculating the optical absorption and then obtaining the dispersion relations. These are the like things that we want to to obtain in the end. So, to con so the photon self energy, like we uh, actually compute the two terms separate. If the RPA is the really like a well known thing where you have uh, the RPA self energy with the occupation factors, damping constant, and energy differences. And in the end, you multiply it with current vertices, which will uh, be related to the electron current within your crystal. And these current vertices uh, will basically contain Kronschambl states uh, and their derivatives. So when you go to the ladder approximation, so this is, these are the vertex uh, corrections, you have a bit of a different thing. And the problem is that this diagram cannot be evaluated. It cannot be factorized. So there are certain issues. But if you could evaluate it, you would again have uh, current vertices, but this time in four places, you would have to evaluate the ladder, ladder four point polarizability, which contains a photonic kernel and you have electron hole propagators, which are going to be used to actually describe the, the, the propagation of the electron and hole within the system. And this in turn, again, contains uh, Green's functions, which in which you can uh, plug in also your GW correction. Um, but okay, there is this issue that we cannot solve this. So instead we have to do a certain approximation and uh, we approximate the interaction between the electron hole uh, in the non-retardation limit. And here we can replace the photon propagator here with a screen coronal interaction. So we are basically assuming that the photon uh, travels from one place to the another uh, instantaneously, but while we still have the retardation effects within the crystals. Um, so when you do that, you get, you can then evaluate the screen coronal interaction, which is uh, going to contain just your bare coronal interaction and time order RPA polarizability. And when you do this whole thing, you're able to 
also replace the current vertices with charge vertices, which are much simpler to, to evaluate. So it's not that you no longer have current vertices, but you got rid of them um, uh, in this point where the electron and hole interact. So this simplifies your diagrams. You have a ladder four point polarizability where the photonic Fock kernel is now your standard Fock kernel. And then you just, after you're evaluating this, you contract the fermionic lines and uh, which is just a summation over bands and KK prime points. Uh, you multiply by the current uh, vertices and uh, this is basically your uh, ladder contribution to the photonic self-energy. And then you plug this photonic self-energy in the Dyson equation, as we said, and this will give you um, the, the coupling. So, okay, if you just look at the photonic self-energy, we are able to describe very accurately the excitons and you get really sharp peaks while describing so this is in phosphorane, for example. And if you exclude the vertex correction, as we would expect, you get a completely, uh, you don't even get the spectrum and uh, the, the exciton um, peak and you get a completely wrong shape of, uh, of uh, the spectrum. This also, the same thing can be applied to different materials and we get uh, consistently expected results. So this is for HBN and the Wolfram disulfide. Um, you can also see a significant difference between the optical gap and uh, the band gap. And then when you solve the second part and uh, obtain the hybrid modes uh, by solving the Dyson's equation, you can see that for a single layer of HBN, the, the dispersion of light is almost unperturbed. So this, this indicates also the dispersion of exciton, but you see where they cross, there is a bit of a change. So, okay, in a single layer HBN, obviously the hybridization between the exciton and a photon is not strong, but if you make a bigger heterostructure and as you add layers, the, this actually coupling strength increases significantly and you see the photon line actually bending significantly. So you really get a very strong hybrid exciton polaritonic modes. And uh, yeah, this, this allows you to, to calculate these kind of properties for many different combinations of Van der Waals heterostructures. Then finally, the question is, okay, but why, why do you want to use the veneer basis at all? And the problem is also because the ladder contribution is extremely difficult to compute. It's a, it's a computationally heavy thing. So you cannot really include many bands. And the thing is that your excitonic properties, for example, in HBN are going to be basically localized around the K point between these two bands. And you don't really need too many of the bands above. But the problem is that the contribution, if you project on atomic states, the problem is that the symmetry of your band is not conserved. Uh, so you actually have to include these free electron bands and just because of the very small contribution at different um, places in the case space. Uh, but when you venerize naturally the uh, band symmetry is conserved. So essentially in the BSC calculation, now we can just take two of these bands and get very accurate uh, excitonic properties without, uh, without having to uh, do a very heavy computation with all the other bands. Uh, but what we do we have to do to actually do this? And there are only two places we have change in the code. So basically we have to rewrite the charge vertices and the current vertices in the Vanier basis. Uh, which is kind of straightforward. Uh, the current vertices can be expressed, will also contain uh, matrix elements of, the, uh, of this form. So I didn't write it out because they are just, um, it's a very troublesome uh, derivation, but in the end you get like four terms similar to this. Uh, so to just change the basis of the charge vertices, you just perform the vanization, you use the unitary matrices and we want to stay in reciprocal space because that's easier. Uh, it's easier to evaluate the propagators uh, in reciprocal space. So we actually work with the smooth block basis after the veneerization. Uh, and after applying uh, the unitary transformation, you can just keep using your, um, your veneerized charge vertices in the rest. Uh, what we were also looking about is could we maybe interpolate, interpolate these um, matrix elements but this turned out uh, not to be so easy. And this is something we're also looking maybe um, 
if somebody has some idea how to do it. But the, as far as we tried, uh, we realized that we have to Fourier transport to real space and then back again. And the problem gets even worse with current vertices, which, where you have four of these matrix elements, which would basically negate any gains in speed. But it would be very useful for us because we really have to have a very dense K mesh and K plus Q mesh to obtain uh, accurate, accurate excitonic properties. So if somebody has some idea, we are we are looking forward to it. Uh, by the way, the code is also going to be open sourced and soon available. It doesn't yet have a name, but it is modular, well documented. And if somebody is interested in these kind of things, uh, we are uh, also looking for uh, collaborators. Uh, so just to conclude my talk, I would just uh, yeah, like to repeat a few main points. This methodology and propagator approach works for both metals and semiconductors. It can describe plasmons, excitons, and hybrids with polaritons very well. You get a fine, you have a finite temperature model, and you can mix different levels of accuracy without having to recompute every thing uh, from zero, like you would have to do in a Hamiltonian approach. And you have a really an ab initio approach, which is uh, like really taking a, into account a quantized, quantized uh, electromagnetic field. Um, yeah, and in the end, uh, we can also uh, notice that the veneer functions might be a very good basis for this type of thing because uh, the bands, uh, they can reduce the number of uh, bands we need in the expensive parts of the computation. Yeah, uh, thank you for your attention and uh, thank you the organizers for uh, giving me the opportunity to present this work. Okay, so thanks for a nice talk. Uh, we're open for questions. Thank you for the nice talk. I mm -hmm. could you repeat the last slide? What was the why do you say that? Sorry, uh, no, it's not efficient or it's difficult. Yeah. Uh, calculating the vertices to fine grid, uh, interpolate to fine grid. Okay. What's the problem with that? Sorry. Uh, so yeah, the problem is that um, the thing is that you cannot really el eliminate. Uh, so when you look at this last line, you cannot really el eliminate the G dependence. So, so you really have this E to the I to the G times R in it. And the matrix elements are between K and K plus Q. And the thing is the grid in Q has to be dense. It has to be has contain really many points. So I don't, so it's not really straightforward to do uh, an interpolation. So if you would make a sparse K grid, the thing is that the Q one depends on the K grid. So, I mean, the thing is that we, we can do some kind of interpolation, but not without actually um, re going to the real space and working with uh, veneer functions in the real space and then applying a wigner zeitz weight and things like that. And then we have to Fourier transform back, but this doesn't really work well because um, we have like for the current vertices, you have five, I think five Fourier transformation back and forth. And this really negates any gains in speed from the, from the interpolation. Ah, sorry. So you want uh some interpolation to a very dense grid, but that's not obvious. That's, that's yeah, yeah, it's important. not obvious how, how we could uh, evaluate these. Thank you. These are electric elements. Yeah. Anyone else? A related question. So here, how many G vectors do you need to include to get good results? Well, this also depends on uh, the accuracy you want. So you could actually take a G equals zero approximation, and this gives you some kind of really, I mean, it works for certain types of excitations, but uh, usually you have to take um, about 130 G vectors. That's like the optimum in terms of accuracy and, uh, and speed. How feasible is this method for a uh very large systems. So obviously Why? it's um, not feasible for very large systems if you want to do it really at the full level. Uh, but uh, if you do some approximation like reducing the number of G vectors or 
uh, you can also, the thing is that you can introduce an approximation. Let me just go back a bit. You can introduce an approximation where you, um, before this last step and you compute like the irreducible, like the photonic self energy for individual monolayers. And then you can do a few tricks and partially free transform this equation um, in, in a Z direction because most of your properties are going to be highly dependent on the Z direction and not so much in plane because the photon wavelengths and uh, resolution in plane, uh, they, they have significant mismatch. So the photon basically sees just a plate, a conductive plate. So you can basically use some delta functions to fix in Z, in the Z direction, your, uh, your photonic self-energy contribution. And then uh, like a summation of these terms will give you like an approximate photonic self-energy, which you don't plug back into the Dyson's equation. And then you can treat really very, very large systems. Like, I don't know, like you can go to the bulk limit eventually. But this is an approximation um if you don't do any approximations then maybe we can treat like seven layers seven layers i mean depends on how large your computer but no, but i was thinking more like uh moiré systems ah, no, have one no. <laughs> no no way no, no absolutely not no it's um it's not going to work like that you have a question so you you mentioned that you do a gw approximation right? yeah but this this is not like the one the standard one for electrons because you care about the photon right yeah so i mean but it's yeah you can do it for electrons but you you could also do a g delta w correction which will also include uh, the the effects due to the photonic yeah but what you system. do is you know you, you take a green function of the of the phone photon that's yeah. what you care about. yes yeah. because if and maybe andrea can comment because it has more expertise than me. But let's say in a GW calculation, the, the cheapest part is the what you call the um, what you call dipoles. So mm -hmm. the, this matrix element that you mentioned, the one mm -hmm. they say that that's the, the cheapest that you know takes like a fraction of the total cost. Mm -hmm. So but, but but here it seems that this is not the case. Okay, I mean the GW creation you can separate from the the whole thing. You know, here, I mean the the charge vertices are not so bad as, for example, okay. evaluating the fork kernel, and you have some matrix inversions which are actually very costly. Uh, but the GW correction you can um, you can compute it uh, in any way you like. I mean, we have our own methods also. So, I mean, can you just? Be more specific about no, your so question. I was so. trying to, because I, I mean, to, to make a parallel with what I know about, you know, GW is better for electrons, mm -hmm. pure electron system. And it seems that so many things are different. Like, for instance, in your case, apparently you don't need so many empty states because you are okay with having just few vanillaized bands, right? Mm -hmm. the, this, this, what you call charge vertices, that I think is what we call dipoles, or correct me if I'm wrong, mm -hmm. it mm -hmm. seems that they are sort of important part, mm -hmm. while for the electrons, is, I mean, it's, it's just like the you never care about them because you care about the, the response function. Of it. I think are uh, are uh, have also finite Q, right? I, I think the dipoles in Yambor just Q going to zero. Yeah, yeah. Here we have a finite Q. Yeah. So it's the whole thing. Yeah, and also, yeah, we have to the GW correction is applied both to the uh, electron hole propagator, so you have to. Two propagators you have to correct and um yeah also if you want a substrate um you also have to do this J delta w because you have um, in the present if you add a substrate to the photonic propagator then you also have a, an additional renormalization of the band gap so this is also a very costly type of computation yeah i didn't talk much about the gw because it has like many repetitive equations but uh yeah so Look, did you find any any gauging issue in passing uh, i mean matching with vanier fan or vanier 90 and uh, uh, the many body code so uh, uh, you know, symmetries and uh, so did you exploit symmetry by the way Yes, yes, we exploit symmetry. I mean, with the veneer, we don't. But uh, when we use the block, like quantum espresso as the base ground state, then we actually exploit the symmetry and compute everything with the irreducible wedge. Yeah. 
but um, with Vanier, I, we, we just did a, like the simplest possible approach with just taking a full billowing zone and uh, work with that. Any other question? So just to make a comment. So usually when people do this disentanglement, it's usually a problem that the band structure doesn't, you know, is not exactly the case, but for, for you are somehow you're helped by having a, this one band instead of having like all of these mm. spaghetti bands, right? Yeah, yeah. We are uh, actually, that's kind of interesting. Uh, so um, I be, think the reason why I might get really okay bands, which, which really look nice, is probably related to the fact that the, like you don't have a mixed system, like a bulk system, but you really have layers which are separate and they only weakly interact. So the band structure, when you, you calculate, for example, for graphene and HBN and combine them, they're basically unperturbed. I mean, a gap opens, but... Uh, so you get bands that closely reproduce the, the, the plane wave phase. Okay. And then the other comment was, so I don't quite understand all this uh, beta cell Peter, but like if you compared your um, uh, uh, absorption with just regular BSC and this BSC uh, with these maybe I actually, effects, maybe I actually like have, what's the difference? Maybe I actually have um, a comparison to show. Uh, so this is some equation. I don't remember for which system. Maybe maybe HBN. But for example, if you do a GPOL calculation, that's with BSC, right? Yeah, with BSC and uh, compared with R calculation the differences are not not very large yeah. but then but then where this helps is when you get this um, like bending of the photon. Yeah, yes yes okay. you, you cannot describe the bending of the photon in uh, in G4 I think I mean you, you, you would so even with finite Q there's this BSC with finite Q yeah yeah it's fine okay and uh, I mean, there are also certain differences that, uh, yeah, I mean, they're mostly related to the approximations. If you want to treat a larger system that here you just do some partial Fourier transforms, eliminate some terms and then Fourier transform back and you have a much simpler equation to solve so we can treat larger system than a GPO. And so when you say retardation effect, that means you basically include like magnetic field also somewhere? Is, is that... uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, the magnetic field could also be included, but... Um... No, is that... No, no. So like physically, what does it mean? Yeah, it is. Yeah, it is. Okay. It is included, yes. But we don't actually look for uh, magnetic modes, which yeah. are also possible. But... And what if you just take like a bulk, you know, because we have a lot of calculations where we compute, a, you know, a optical property for bulk. Okay. And then for some metal, right? There, there have been a lot of talks, but then um, people assume that, you know, when you cut this and make a, you know, they, they use some kind of approximation to, because in experiment, you actually have a surface. Mm -hmm. So could you use this to also just apply it to like a normal metal, you know, I don't know, gold or something um, with a surface and would you get anything different? So yes, you can apply it on a metal, like a, a like a, I mean, a layer of metal, but uh, huh. you cannot really go to the bulk limit because we do certain um tricks within the okay. constructing the propagators to uh you know separate the x y and the z uh, components because the x y doesn't play a large but role would that be important because like a lot of optical properties we compute for like simple bulk metals mm -hmm. they're, they're, they're done in bulk yeah yeah i mean this method in principle can can reproduce that but the way that our code works you cannot just add a bulk system and expect uh, yeah, okay. it, everything will work. Yeah. Antimo, what's uh, are there any, any other questions? Or? Yes. To ask you, so how do you do? How do you do with um, how do you deal with empty states? I know I already asked this, but I elaborate a bit more. So, mm -hmm. is it everything done with a localized basis or not? I mean, it works with any kind of basis because the empty states will basically have a, like a zero contribution to your response function eventually so it will not affect your um, your pro like your final dispersion relation so okay okay so, but yeah. you know also you know also basic 
in the basic GW approximation, you have no these empty states. Yeah, I mean we we are, we also have some empty sta states, but and, the, but the, uh, and but if you add them, I mean in Vanier, yes, we, we didn't. <laughs> ah, okay, I just want to understand yeah, if, but, they come, uh, if they come from the Vanier functions or they, if they are the plane waves. No, so so the empty states come from the plane waves. Ah, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. in Vanier there are. There okay, okay, no, that that was. Yeah. Uh, but uh, as they have uh, this very small, con like very small contributions, okay. which are also in the symmetry part, uh, then we can get rid of them. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Yes, we're coffee break. Yeah, so coffee break now. Uh, but let's thank the speaker again. Thank you. Thank you. Very nice. <laughs> Thank you.